So I want to welcome everyone and uh, thank you everybody for joining us today for our next uh, Aurora Research Institute speaker series. Um, so my name is Amanda and I'm with Aurora Research Institute here in Inuvik and I have to say it is really, really wonderful to see so many people from the Northwest Territories, from Canada, and we even have some international guests here joining us um, to learn all about Beluga research in the Inuvialuit settlement region. Um, so I, first, I want to start by acknowledging that, you know, us here in Inuvik, we are on the traditional land of the Inuvialuit and the Gwich'in people. And we want to extend our deepest respect and appreciation for sharing this land with us. And we also, you know, further extend our respect to all of the First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples of the North who call this territory home. So as part of our mandate, the Aurora Research Institute has been running a speaker series for many, many years. And in 2020, we, like many people, had to adapt. So we switched our speaker series to become virtual. And that enabled us to continue sharing with so many people now, and even to a larger audience, some of the really exciting research that's happening in the Northwest Territories. So for this speaker series, it's actually really special. We have partnered with ArcticNet, and we've brought together a really amazing diverse panel. So we've got representatives from Department of Fisheries and Oceans, the University of Manitoba, and the Joint Secretariat for the Inuvialuit Settlement Region. This webinar is supported by the Climate Change Preparedness in the North program, along with the Government of Canada's Canadian, Canadian Climate Centre for Climate Services. That's a mouthful. So before we get started today, I just want to go over a very few housekeeping items just so that everyone is aware of how they can participate in today's webinar. So we're going to begin um, by showing a couple pre-recorded presentations. They're really short. Um, and as we're watching these pre-recorded presentations at any time during the webinar, if you have questions about the presentation or questions for the panelists, please, 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 you can type them into the question and answer box or into the chat box. We'll be monitoring both of them. Um, just to let everybody know this webinar is being recorded. So we're going to, once we've got, you know, once we're finished, we always like to share them on our website. So if, you know, you know somebody who wasn't able to make it today or if you wanted to revisit something, we'll share the link with everybody. So just everybody knows we are being recorded. We also are joined by another special guest today. So we have a graphic recorder, Jasmine Kiogak, and she's gonna be joining us today and creating a graphic visual summarizing the information that we're sharing today about Beluga Research in the ISR. So please stay tuned to Aurora Research Institute's Facebook page, and we will be sharing the graphic publicly as soon as we get it from the artist. So we'd like to start now and introduce you to our panelists and to all the experts that are joining us here today. The first is Lisa Lissetto. Lisa is a research scientist at Fisheries and Oceans Canada, and she's also an associate professor at the Center for Earth Observation Science at the University of Manitoba. Lisa's been conducting research on beluga whales in the ISR since the start of her PhD in 2004. She strives to bring together knowledge on beluga whales for strength in decision making and co-management for conservation. We also have Inu Sudlanovic. Inu is a PhD student at the University of Manitoba and she's supervised by Lisa Lissetto. Inu was born and raised in Iqaluit, although she's currently based uh, in Winnipeg. Her work focuses on beluga health and Inuit Kwaoyi Mayatu Kwanik, or Inuit knowledge, across Inuit Nungat. We've got Luke Story, who is a PhD student at the University of Manitoba. Luke's work focuses on tracking the movements of belugas using satellite link tags. And in his presentation, Luke's gonna share some of the results about the diving behavior of the Eastern Beaufort Sea belugas. We've got Shannon McPhee, who is a biologist with Fisheries and Oceans Canada, based in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Uh, people in the ISR probably know Shannon because she's usually up here for about three to five months every year working in the Inuvialuit settlement region. She's coordinating uh, the community-based field program. She's attending co-management board meetings and delivering workshops with a lot of the reg or regional partners. And finally, we've got Shakita Grubin, who is a junior resource coordinator with the Joint Secretariat in Inuvik. The Joint Secretariat was created to support the interests and activities of wildlife and environmental councils, committees, and boards that were all established as part of the Inuvialuit final agreement. 
So I'm going to turn it over to Lisa for a quick introduction into the Beluga research. And please, everyone, enjoy the presentations. And like I said, feel free at any time to post your questions. And we'll have a chance for, to, for the panelists to answer as many of the questions as possible. Okay, let me know which screen that you're seeing. Are you seeing the, the right presenter view? Okay. Is that better? That is better. Okay, welcome. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lisa Lucetto. I'm reaching you here today from Winnipeg, located on Treaty 1 territory. Um, the original lands of the Anishinaabe, the Cree, the Ojibwe, the Dakota, Dene people, and homeland of the Métis Nation. So today myself and four members of my research team are going to share with you little nuggets of projects that you've heard briefly about. And in fact, some of you might have been aware that we were hoping to hold a second uh, Beluga Summit to get everyone together to share knowledge. And, and that's unfortunately not happening due to the pandemic. So today provides an opportunity to share information, but we're still hoping on creating additional sharing venues. So stay tuned for that. I did want to acknowledge before we begin our presentations, uh, the people who have come here before us to start a lot of this fantastic beluga research. Canada is represented um, very well by having the longest beluga monitoring program based here in the New Bialowit settlement region. Um, and I also want to take a moment to acknowledge that there's a few of us speaking today, but really we're representing a large range of partnerships and other people based um, at DFO in Winnipeg, as well as in Inuvik, uh, the University of Manitoba, and also here in the ISR. I did want to give a particular focus and attention to identify our important research partners, um, specifically regional boards, such, such as the Fisheries Joint Management Committee, territorial groups, including the Aurora Research Institute, of course, uh, the local HTC, so hunters and trappers communities, the community members themselves, um, hunters and families who have generously shared their samples to facilitate research, but also their knowledge to guide research. And so we believe through the partnerships and participation um, with the New Vialowit that we've had, that we've, we've really uh, are lucky to have a program that's been shaped not only in the type of research we do, but how we do our research. Um, I did want to just end to highlight that youth is such an important part of the research that we do. Uh, and we've worked with many youth, and so we're, I know this is really um, partly directed toward an Aurora College group. And so often at this time of the year, we would pop into a class in, in Inuvik at the Aurora College and talk about our research and try to engage and talk about opportunities with our program. So while we're not doing that in, per in person, we encourage you to reach out to your teacher or the, the ARI and talk and reach out and tell us if you're interested um, and maybe thinking about other ways to connect with our programs and, and I guess all to say let's let's stay in touch. So with that, I'll hand it back over to you. Hello, my name is Lisa Lucetto, and I'm a research scientist at Fisheries and Oceans Canada and an assistant professor at the University of Manitoba. And today I'll be talking to you about a collaborative beluga health research program I run in partnership uh, with Indigenous organizations from the Inuvialuit settlement region, including local HTC. And what I'll be doing is sharing with you how we've collected information over a long time period and how we can use unusual events to provide information about how the population ecosystem health is doing. So I use beluga whales as a sentinel species to tell us about this system as it's a means of integrating food webs given its high trophic level status, but also its habitat um, can tell us a little bit about interactions within the system as, as we see uh, losses of ice over time. Now, beluga whales are circumpolar in their distribution. There are about 21 different stocks or populations recognized. And the population I'll be speaking to about today is the Eastern Beaufort Sea beluga population that spends its summering in summering time in this green area here, the Beaufort Sea, Chuchi, and it winters in this green circle over here at the Bering Sea. So it has a large home range, probably the largest, 
it's also one of the largest populations, last estimated at 40,000. So it's also seen as a healthy population. This population is very valuable to the Nubialuit for the cultural, nutri nutritional, and spiritual well-bringing it, it gives. Um, here I have on the left a historical photo of a Nubialuit using beluga, as well as a contemporary present time photo um, of an elder, Clara Day, uh, that I have the, the honor to work with. And here she's teaching Kayla Hansen Craig how to prepare beluga blubber and muktuk for drawing and for usuk. Anubialuit are co-managers of their resources, including beluga, and so are participants in defining how we look at managing the stock and conducting research for population health conservation management. Here I'm showing you a hard to see table, but highlighting and demonstrating um, how Anubialuit were tracking the stock, um, how they were harvesting the stock over time. And so here this program has an, an um, a very long-term data set that we could draw from. How the Nubialuit have thought about managing the stock has grown to, to consider conservation management and demonstrated, and they've demonstrated leadership in the creation of marine protected areas that look at not only protecting the beluga, but also the habitat they rely on and recognizing, of course, its inclusion of how it supports human health. Over time, that um, that management application and thinking about research has grown to look something like this. Now the Beluga Health Monitoring Program takes a very holistic approach measuring numerous different indicators or metrics of health in beluga whales. However, how do we take that, all of those pieces, and think about again how we look at beluga population health? So this is a little bit more complex. A lot of the metrics we're looking at are measurements taken at a cellular level from these harvested whales. And so they're very focused on that individual beluga. And now we want to raise questions about how we take that information and look at it at a population status. Um, so here I draw examples to looking at humans. So as a human, at an individual level, we may go in to see our doctor for a physical who will take a number of different measurements and check to see if it falls within the norm, whether that's our, our um, our, our heart pressure or her sugar levels. Um, and, and these norms are set on different uh, baselines defined for humans. But this information can also be plotted over time to look at how things might be changing in human demographics, whether that's obesity or diabetes, to get a sense of human population health. Well, we could say the same could be done for belugas. We have this long-term data set, you know, spanning back as far as the 70s for some metrics. Um, and, and more recently, different metrics. But we can look at these trends and ask what is changing and what might that mean for the beluga population. Climate change is an incredible important factor that we can start looking at and asking how is that affecting beluga health? And here is exactly what Lois Harwood did where she plotted a decline of size at age over time from 1993 to 2008. We see whales are getting smaller. So this raises a lot of questions about um, how do we measure beluga health through condition? How do we measure condition? So I had a few students taking a look at how we can look at condition through looking at blood breath thickness or girth and building into that um, assessment or model how we in include age, um, length, and other ways of looking at um, condition. So we developed a model that allowed us to plot something like blood breath thickness over time, which I'm showing you here. And you see what almost looks like a wave suggesting things go up and down, which uh, seems, you know, uh, normal. And But what, what we've also plotted, what we wanted to do is think about thresholds. So this, this burgundy line here is the blubber thickness modeled out from an unfortunate event of um, an ice entrapment where whales were emaciated. And so we looked at that blubber thickness and now identify that as, as a very low level that we don't want, of course, whales to reach. But just like you don't go to the doctor when you're already close to death, um, we should be able to start thinking about identifying thresholds much earlier. So here I'm proposing uh, looking at these, these uh, higher thresholds or lower thresholds. And I wanted to pull out this example from 2014. And use 2014 as an example of an unusual event that asks us to dive in and look closer at what might be happening here in the population. 2014 um, was also a year where we were doing, um, Sonia Ostertag was leading a traditional knowledge study on beluga health, working with four different communities in the New Yellowwood Settlement region 
These are just some of the findings of which there are many, but 2014 depicted in red did identify itself as a slightly less healthy year for beluga um, based on a, a list of different metrics. And it's important to recognize that hunters are biased in what they're hunting. Of course, they're going to go after the better looking whales that are healthy. So this is already recognizing a subset of healthy whales. At the same time, I had a, a PhD student looking to develop a quantitative model using fatty acids to characterize what beluga were eating. And by and large, Arctic cod were the most important prey. And this is a limpid rich fish that is um, found throughout the Arctic which he did find in her short four-year study uh, was a decline in this, pre in this prey in our predator. So we do know as we look closer that there was an unusual event in 2014. Belugas showed up in large numbers in places they weren't commonly seen, in, um, specifically Uluhaktuk and Saks Harbor uh, during the month of July. And in Uluhaktuk they landed those whales and provided us an opportunity to learn from that. Um, they sampled stomachs, and what we found, for the most part, these stomachs were full of very small sandlands rather than Arctic cod. What we also know from a fish trawler out in the area was that 2014 was an extreme low year for our adult Arctic cod in the area. In addition to that, uh, we know through some of the other work that took place was that it was a a year of an extreme um, high biomass at the phytoplankton level. So while there's less information for some of these other trophic levels, we have a lot of long-term data to look at with beluga whales. And so we now can ask that question, uh, when beluga whales went to these, er these areas they don't typically visit, were they displaced in search of their nutritional prey source? We also wanted to think about scaling back to the physical system and saying, what were some of those physical drivers that might have manifested uh, these different ecosystem level changes? And we know uh, 2014 presented what was called the blob, extreme warm temperature ocean surface water that was making its way north. However, we also see this again, the blob manifest itself in 2019. So this is the second uh, unusual event I want to bring your attention to to discuss. In 2019, we had an anomaly year for extreme high temperatures and sea surface temperature. And we also, in the New Gallowit Settlement region, saw some other unusual, um, un un unusual events here. We saw three neonate strandings in the Delta at two different locations in the month of July. We were lucky in that we had a veterinarian with us at Hendrickson Island and was able to do a full necropsy to see if we can understand what happened. Uh, what we do know is that the, the neonate died shortly after birth and might suggest complications uh, in the birthing. But let's look a little further. What can we gather from this unusual year? We can look at beluga condition again using that modeled blubber uh, mass index. Now, unfortunately, because we don't have age, we weren't able to put that into the model. So this graph looks a little bit different than the previous one. But I did want to highlight 2019 was a low blubber thickness year, but not incredibly low. It's in line with other years in the past, but it is lower than what we saw in 2018 by about a centimeter and a half to two centimeters. Now, we didn't have a full-blown um, TK study. We did have some conversations with knowledge holders who explained to us that the whales looked good, uh, but the blubber was a bit thinner than usual, and the amount of oil it produced was much less, which is very interesting and something we hope to look into further. So we asked the question, what were beluga eating uh, in those years, given the lower blubber thickness in 2019? So we take a look at those that quantitative model and run an assessment, and we see both 2019 and 2018 are low years for the amount of Arctic cod uh, in beluga diet. Um, and, and what's interesting to me is just thinking about that blubber thickness was thicker in 2018, but the diet appears the same. So to me, that suggests that beluga are uh, eating less Arctic cod, but maybe eating less or nutritionally deprived in 2019. So we might ask, well, what does that mean? What is the significance, again, to the whale health? And these are questions we'll, we'll be asking for a long time. So here's one thing we could look at, which is cortisol, a stress hormone. So I'm just showing you a couple of years here, suggesting that 2019 is slightly higher. And is now giving us a window again to think about how we look at changes in the population and what does that mean to their overall health? So to summarize, here I pulled out two years where we saw unusual events. One was the displacement of beluga whales in 2014, and the other was a mortality event of neonates. 
And in both circumstances, when we looked at the harvested whales, again, whales selected to be um, biased and healthy, they, they had lower blub blubber thicknesses on those two years. TK identified that as a slightly less healthy year. We know through our investigations of fatty acids that they were eating less Arctic cod, but there might be indications of this Arctic cod, um, I guess, reduction might extend beyond the Beaufort Sea, and we need to consider the Bering Sea where they winter. Additionally, there were changes and manifestations of um, shifts in the physical system, so extreme warm years, and of course I haven't had a chance to touch on ice and other. But altogether, what I'm highlighting here is having that baseline gives us an opportunity to look at these unusual events. Now, while they might not be extremes, um, they are giving us the opportunity to dig into that window and say, what is happening here? And allow us to ask, how resilient are beluga to some of these changes that might not be necessarily uh, extreme, as extreme as, let's say, the entrapment? During these years of lower blubber thickness, are belugas more vulnerable to other stressors, like shipping, if we anticipate that to increase? Um, but overall, what I'm showing you here is that we, we really need to continue these health trend monitoring assessments to be able to look at these unusual events and ask questions about what they mean to the beluga population health as well as to the ecosystem health. So with that, I end my talk. Thank you, Kiwinami. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was a really wonderful overview of the Beluga Research Program. And I think it really highlighted the partnerships and how, you know, having our uh, community members and regional partners really helps for the success of the program. And I just kind of want to reiterate something Lisa said to any of the students that are watching today. You know, please get a hold of ARI or ask your instructors if you are interested in getting involved in the Beluga project. Uh, the research group has been up here for many years and they really have a great track record of training so many youth within the region. So just while we are queuing up the next, or the, sorry, the next presentation, um, I just actually wanted to ask a quick question of our audience. So a poll should be popping up on your screen right now. And we're just curious to know where you're logging in from today. So we've got, um, you know, we've got panelists that are here. Chiquita's here in Inuvik from the ISR. We've got people from Manitoba and Winnipeg. We even have a panelist who is calling in from Wales. So we're just really curious to know where are you guys tuning in from? Excellent. And it looks like we have a lot of Northerners, which is really great to see. Oh, actually, quite a few people calling in from outside Canada. That's awesome. So thank you guys so much for letting us know just where you're tuning in from. So I'm going to close the poll. And then we are going to hear from our next presenter, which is Eno. Comparing two completely different whale populations can be really interesting. But when we also compare local contexts, that can be just as interesting. I'm Inuya Salavinak, and I'm a PhD student at University of Manitoba. My PhD is on beluga health with a comparative approach looking at two populations. I'll be investigating population health and links to culture in Inuit climate to Hangit. Despite current setbacks caused by the ongoing pandemic, these projects are still underway. Marine mammals across the Arctic provide a staple food items for many Inuit communities across the Arctic. Hunting methods and preferences exist within each region or even community, which could occur because of environmental or biological diversity in the area. Beluga are one such species. They are a circumpolar species that number at around 200,000 individuals. The North Atlantic Marine Mammal Commission developed a list dividing them into 21 stocks based on nearshore areas and open water seasons. Of the 21 populations, all of those in Canada are harvested by Inuit. Beluga are also sentinel species, meaning they act as indicators on ocean health and even connect us with Inuit health. Such a difference can be seen between the Eastern Beaufort Sea and Western Hudson Bay where Inuit in each region have different hunting and food practices. 
Where Inuit in the Inuvialuit settlement region consume and love beluga meat, Inuit in Akvia do not, or at least have not in the recent decades, consume beluga meat. Inuit in the ISR also render fat to make oksok. This highlights some differences in food prep between regions. Such differences between regions can be due to many things, such as colonial histories or simple food preference. What we do know is that Inuit in both regions contain great knowledge on beluga in their respective regions. These knowledges are formed based on local context and circumstances. We also know that both regions harvest from two of Canada's largest beluga populations. And of the two, the beluga in the eastern Beaufort Sea are the most extensively studied, especially when compared to Western Hudson Bay. The fact that these two beluga populations are the two largest provides a great opportunity to compare these two large and healthy populations. Mercury is a pollutant that makes its way to the Arctic through long-range transportation. When this pollutant makes its way into the food chain, it bioaccumulates and has been recorded in high concentrations in cetaceans, such as belugas. Mercury is a toxin that has recorded toxicity effects in marine mammals. Such toxicity includes immunotoxicity, which reduces immune responses in whales, and neurotoxicity, which impacts brain chemical composition, along with a number of other effects. Beluga is also thought to be a vector of mercury into Inuit who consume beluga products. So the question we're trying to answer today is, are there differences between mercury concentrations within these two populations? And what does that mean for local contexts? Now we know that the marine environment in the Arctic can act as a sink for mercury. And we also know that beluga liver contains high mercury concentrations. But we're more interested in the skin and muscle, which are both consumed by Inuit. Liver is a measurement of health within the whale. Whereas we can look at skin and muscle as ink points to see how much mercury could be transported from the whale to people who eat them. Looking at the historical mercury data set from both regions, we know that the Eastern Beaufort Sea has higher mercury concentrations than the Western Hudson Bay. We also know that age affects mercury. So older whales will have more mercury concentration than younger whales. Looking at the whales themselves, we know that the liver has the highest concentration, then followed by the kidney, the muscle, and muktak, which has the lowest mercury concentrations. Looking at the literature, such as this paper from Lockhart, we see that beluga in the Western Canadian Arctic, such as the Eastern Beaufort Sea, have mercury concentrations that were increasing from 1981 to 2002. But another study conducted by Lissetto found that trends were decreasing from 2002 to 2012. Here, where you're looking strictly at two populations. Where Lockhart looked across the whole Arctic, we are looking at two regions. And although we do have some overlapping data sets from Department of Fisheries and Oceans, we will be looking at Hendrickson Island and Akviat Nunavut. Lacetta's paper looked across the whole Eastern Beaufort Sea, and here we are focusing in on Hendrickson Island and East Whitefish, which are both in the Inuit Valley Settlement region. We compared these two regions by going back through this data from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and looking at total mercury concentrations in the liver, skin, muscle, and kidney. As we stated before, muscle and skin are consumed across the Arctic by Inuit and may be better indicators than the liver or kidney, which are not consumed. Now, when we look at the skin or the muck dock between Eastern Beaufort Sea and Western Hudson Bay, we can confirm that the Eastern Beaufort Sea has higher concentrations 
than the Western Hudson Bay when we combine these two data sets. Similarly, when we look at the muscle concentrations of mercury, the same is also true. We see that the mercury concentrations in Eastern Beaufort Sea are significantly higher than those in Western Hudson Bay. This appears to be consistent in the liver and kidney as well. Although other studies have stipulated the cause could be due to sampling frequency, with Eastern Beaufort Sea, such as Hendrickson Island, having more consistent sampling than anywhere else. It's important to remember that mercury exists in different forms. So although mercury exists in high concentrations in the liver, most of it is present in its inert form. Whereas in the skin and muscle, where it's present in much lower concentrations, it's mostly present in its organic form. The reason for this could be the relationship between mercury and selenium in the liver. However, this relationship will not be explored in this presentation. More information can be gleaned by looking at the slope of the liver, mercury concentrations, and age. Looking at the slope of the means, we can see that Hendrickson Island whales have significantly steeper slopes than Ukliat whales. This may tell us that whales in the Eastern Beaufort Sea, such as Hendrickson Island, could be exposed to higher mercury concentrations than those whales in Akviat. Other papers also found relationships between length and total mercury concentrations, which can be explored by diet variances between populations or individuals within populations. When we look at the length for each region, we see that the mean length is significantly higher in the Eastern Beaufort Sea, such as Hendrickson Island, than in the Western Hudson Bay area in Elkvia, Nunavut. These differences in length could actually be morphological characteristics of the population, where belugas in Western Hudson Bay are shorter with a wider girth than those in the Eastern Beaufort Sea. Further analysis will be conducted to investigate these potential morphological differences. Now, when we compare the age of the whales harvested in each region, we can see that the whales harvested in Hendrickson Island are older than the ones that are harvested in Akviat. Now, what the reasoning for this is, we don't know yet, but we hope to find out by doing more interviews in Akviat and Hendrickson Island. Looking at the recent literature, we can see that beluga are still at a high risk for mercury concentrations and environmental change. And this gives us a great opportunity to keep comparing these two large and healthy populations. We hope to look deeper into innate preferences and hunting practices within each region. But so far, we can see that the same sampling program does have slightly different local contexts and applications for each region. Namely, because Alkviat does not typically consume beluga meat, this would change our messaging for this region when compared to the ISR. But we still think it's important to keep things as transparent as possible and to keep open communication between research partners and community members. With that, I would like to thank everyone for their time and for listening, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Excellent video. I loved watching that video. Thank you so much, Inu. Um, you know, one thing I didn't realize is that there was all these differences in the beluga populations between the Eastern and the Western Arctic and also between the way uh, Inuit used the beluga. So that was really great to learn. Um, so we're going to get ready for our next presentation. But in the meantime, I do have a second question for the audience. And uh, I see that we do have quite a few students in the audience from Aurora College, which is wonderful. So this one, we've heard both Lisa and Inu talking about there is a distinct number of different beluga populations in the circumpolar region. So maybe this can be like bonus marks, but we're just going to do a quick test. How many recognized beluga populations are there in the circumpolar region? So Lisa mentioned it and Inu mentioned it in their talks. And let's see if anybody can remember. B. 
beautiful. Okay, I'm gonna leave this up for one. Oh, look at that, we've got like quite a variety of answers. So I'm gonna share the results and then maybe we'll have Inu come back on and tell which one is correct. So I am ending the poll and now, okay. So the majority of people thought there was 21 populations. We had a couple people think there was just one population, 42, 5, 11, 29. Inu, can you unmute yourself and tell us the correct answer? Hey, um, yeah, well, in my, I, th I think we had different answers. It depends what standard you're looking at <laughs> but I think I said 21. I used your talk so yeah 21. <laughs> oh, okay okay. <laughs> awesome so yeah there is 21 around 21 I guess arguably depending on uh, what standards you're using but 21 distinct populations of beluga in the circumpolar region. So now we're going to move on to our next panelist and we are going to hear from Luke about beluga diving behavior. Hello, my name is Luke Story. I'm a PhD student at the University of Manitoba with Lisa Lissetto, and I work on beluga movement ecology. So I analyse data from tagged belugas to understand more about their movements and their behaviour in relation to the environment. Today I'm sharing some of the analyses that we are undertaking with the Eastern Beaufort Sea beluga tagging data. So the tags that we deploy on belugas collect data on their movements and their dive behaviour, as well as the environment. And then these tags transmit the data to satellites when the whale surfaces. In the summers of 2018 and 2019, we had tagging field programs from Hendrickson Island, which involved five of the six communities of the Inuvialuit settlement region. To deploy these tags, we used a live capture method, as well as a harpoon deployed method, which has been co-developed with the Inuvialuit. I'm showing this figure to outline where the eastern Beauport sea belugas go. So each coloured line here shows the movement track of an individual whale. And this figure shows all of the belugas tagged between 1993 and 2019. So in the summer, belugas are typically in the Beaufort Sea and the Arctic Archipelago region. In fall, they move westwards over the deeper waters of the Arctic Basin and head into the northern Chukchi Sea. They move into the Bering Sea in winter and they tend to stay there until early spring when they migrate northwards again. So because tag technology is improving all the time, in 2018 and 2019, we were able to deploy tags which collected high resolution location and depth data, as well as data on the water column temperature and salinity. And some of these tags collected data for a whole year. So this kind of data enables us to answer more questions on beluga movements, dive behavior, and the environment than was previously possible. So firstly, I've been characterizing the year-round dive behavior of Eastern Beaufort Sea Belugas, and we're close to submitting this manuscript. Classifying and then quantifying dive behavior is critical in marine mammal studies, as belugas spend most of their lives submerged beneath the surface, and diving may represent a number of behaviors, such as foraging, transiting, or social behaviors. By characterizing and classifying dives by time and depth metrics, we can better identify what behaviours are represented by dives, and then this helps us to identify important components of beluga ecology, such as the energetic costs and gains of different dives, as well as identifying key habitats for specific behaviours, such as foraging. In this study, we classified and characterised over 90,000 dives into eight dive types. We then compared the structure and relative frequency of dives and discussed likely functions in relation to beluga physiology and knowledge on marine mammal dive behavior. And then we've compared dive behavior amongst regions and seasons and discussed this in relation to prey distribution and environmental conditions. One of the key findings of this study was that dive behavior varies by region and season. So as you saw, in July and August, these belugas were typically in Viscount Melville Sound and the Amundsen Gulf regions, which can be seen in the upper right map. This figure shows a series of dives, so depth is on the y-axis and time is on the x-axis, and then seafloor depth is shaded grey at the bottom. You can see a set of dives over a 24-hour period, 
and belugas were typically diving to the seafloor at depths between 400 and 500 metres throughout the day in these regions. On this particular day, the beluga made 43 dives to the seafloor at over 400 metres deep. These dives are typically long, averaging over 16 minutes. They had a long bottom duration and a consistent bottom depth, and then a long time recovering at the surface after making each dive, around five minutes. Reports from Inuvialuit hunters indicate that belugas harvested during July and August sink, whereas those harvested during fall float. This suggests that belugas must feed extensively at this time to rebuild their blubber layer after their spring migration and summer molting periods in the estuaries. And studies on the diets of male belugas from this population and the distribution of fish species in this region suggest that this type of dive behaviour is likely important for feeding on a large biomass of arctic cod at the seafloor. These deep dives were most frequently followed by one or more shallow v-shaped dives. These were only around 12 metres deep and very short, less than three minutes on average, and involved the whales slowly descending to this depth before slowly ascending to the surface. The structure and relative frequency of this type of dive suggests that it's likely used in resting, digestion or transiting between deeper dives. The Lugas in this study spent some time along the Beaufort slope from late spring into fall, and you can see this region in the top right figure. The Lugas were also principally diving to the seafloor in these areas, however these were deeper than in the Arctic archipelago region, frequently reaching over a thousand metres. These include the deepest and longest dives recorded by a beluga whale, which were 1,400 metres deep and 32 and a half minutes long respectively. Again, belugas were likely targeting Arctic cod in this region, but also Greenland halibut, which can be found at the seafloor in these depths. So instead, during late fall through winter, belugas occupied the Chukchi and then the Bering Sea, shown in the upper right map. The seafloor depths are much shallower in these regions, around 50 metres, and during this period belugas were diving with their greatest intensity. So in this figure you can see that this beluga recorded 82 dives to the seafloor over a 12-hour period. These dives were shorter than the dives in the summer, but they had a long bottom duration. And because they were so short and relatively shallow, belugas spent much shorter times recovering at the surface between dives, only around one and a half minutes. The ability to dive intensively with less time required for recovery could enable belugas to be less selective about their prey and have a more generalist diet at this time compared to the summer. This is supported by studies on whales harvested during their spring migration, which found that belugas feed on a variety of prey at this time, including shrimp, octopus and fishes. The prey which are targeted and the energetic costs and gains of targeting various prey has implications for why and when belugas migrate, and we will explore this further in a later paper. I'm also looking at how dive behaviour varies with the time of day and the light regime in the Arctic. This is interesting as few studies have looked at how the behaviour of higher predators varies with the Arctic light regimes, which go from 24 hour daylight to 24 hour darkness, as well as periods with the day night cycle. It can also provide insight into the vertical distribution of prey in understudied areas and inform on the times of day that belugas undertake important activities such as foraging which then has implications for the timing of human activities in this region. I'm exploring this behaviour over the annual cycle, but for this example, I'm showing you the dive behaviour from an area of the Central Arctic Ocean region, and it's during fall when the day-night cycle in light has started. And you can see this location in the upper right map. So this figure in the bottom left also shows a series of dives over a 48-hour period, and the background colour is shaded by the daily light regime. So yellow is daytime when the sun is above the horizon, grey denotes dusk when the sun is below the horizon and setting, and red denotes dawn, so the sun is below the horizon and rising. In this series of dives, you can see that the deepest dives to around 600 metres were made during daylight hours. Instead, during night, diving was shallower and appeared to become progressively shallower as the sun was further below the horizon and the night was darker. And then after sunrise, there were signs of increased surface activity, so either resting on the surface or shallow diving behaviour. 
This type of behavior suggests that belugas were tracking the light mediated changes in the vertical distribution of prey throughout the day. So it appears that they're targeting prey which is deeper during daylight hours and then shallower during the night. So I'm also going to be identifying habitat suitability for the Eastern Beaufort sea belugas across their range. This involves identifying the environmental drivers of distribution and then making accurate predictions of their distribution over a broader range to where they were observed. So habitat suitability modelling studies typically use animal locations without considering animal behaviour at these locations. So instead, I will use the locations of specific behaviours, namely the dive types and the dive parameters identified in this dive characteristic study to model the habitat suitability for specific behaviours. So in the next example I show you, I use the locations of these deep foraging type dives to identify critical foraging habitats. So in running a preliminary model on this, I focused on Viscount Melville Sound and I associated the locations of these dives to a series of environmental parameters, including seafloor characteristics and sea ice concentration. And the model with the best fit included seafloor depth, sea ice concentration and the angle of the slope. So for this specific deep foraging type behaviour, belugas like areas with a greater seafloor depth over 400 metres deep, moderate sea ice concentration, around 70%, and a steep slope angle. So just to show you what this means under specific environmental conditions, the sea ice coverage shown in this figure is from late August 2018, and we can predict where the most suitable habitat occurs under these conditions. So in this figure on the right, the warmer colours denote more suitable habitat, and the cooler colours denote less suitable habitat. The optimal habitat occurs in this central deep channel within Viscount Melville Sound, and then habitat gets less suitable to the south, where there's dense pack ice, as well as to the north, where there's open water and shallower conditions. So we hope to use this information to identify critical habitats for specific behaviours and predict which habitats may be suitable for belugas in future climate change scenarios, for example, under different sea ice and water temperature conditions. And then we also plan to use this information in helping to protect critical habitats from human activities such as shipping, which is especially important in areas such as this, which is undergoing decreases in sea ice coverage and increases in shipping traffic. Thank you for listening to this presentation. You're welcome to ask me any questions now, or you can contact me via my email address. Awesome. Thank you, Luke. Um, I don't know if anybody, so I was listening to the numbers during that presentation and how you talked about 90,000 dives that you had analyzed. Holy smokes. Uh, and then I was listening to some of the stats and I guess just comparing to my own diving behavior when you were like, oh yeah, they go down for 16 minutes and the longest recorded was 32 minutes. That's crazy. Um, so I want to, you know, we've got a couple questions popping in into the Q&A and into the chat. So please, you know, feel free to continue to type your questions in there. And like I said, once we've seen all the videos, I'm going to open up all of our panelists are more than happy to chat and to answer your questions. Um, so just while we are getting ready for the next video, we have another question for our audience. And right now, what we want to know is, so we know where you're calling in or tuning in from, but we want to know why you're tuning in or what brought you to this presentation today. So please select as many of those answers as you feel apply to you. But what brought you in today? Why are you here to hear about Beluga? Yeah, let us know what brought you in today. And we've got a bunch of answers. So I'm going to keep it open just for another couple seconds, let's say 30 seconds, because I can still see a lot of people voting. And that's pretty cool. We've got quite a few audience members who have participated in the Beluga Research Program themselves. Excellent. Okay. So I, oh, there's still more people voting. Maybe I'll give five more seconds. All right. So I'm just going to share that with our audience just so you guys can see where, well, who's all joining us today and kind of what brought you guys in. 
So it's so awesome to see. We've got about a quarter of our audience uh, has participated in Beluga Research before. So that is wonderful. Thank you guys for tuning in. So now we are going to tune into our next video, which is Shannon. And she's going to share about the harpooning program. Good afternoon. My name is Shannon McPhee, and I'm a biologist with Fisheries and Oceans Canada based in Winnipeg. And today I will be uh, speaking about a project that has involved um, uh, the collaboration and the contributions from many individuals who have contributed their, their knowledge, their skills, and their expertise um, in many different ways. And I'll speak of some of those, um, those methods that we've used to work together uh, throughout, throughout the talk. And today I will be focusing on the, the development of harpoon tagging method as a new tool to gather movement data for Beaufort Sea beluga whales based on Western science and a new valid knowledge. Every year, thousands of Eastern Beaufort Sea beluga whales aggregate in the Mackenzie Estuary in July where they're harvested by new valid. Tagging data have provided important information needed to manage for a healthy population including information, for example, on seasonal distribution and home range. However, methods for marine mammal tagging remain controversial. For beluga whales, current methods require the live capture, handling, and implant of rods to attach the tag. So this method is well developed, but it does present risk to people and to whales, and it requires a large crew and significant logistical effort. And capture is not possible at all locations, and so what could happen is that movement data are biased towards uh, the demographics of a certain capture location or capture constraints. Um, for example, for in the Canadian Beaufort Sea, the majority of tagged belugas are males within a narrow size range, uh, tagged within a single bay. Following several major community engagement events, the New Valorant community members identified collecting updated movement data for Eastern Beaufort Sea Beluga as a research priority in their area. In response to concerns over climate change, changes they had observed in prey distribution and increased vessel traffic. And tagging was later identified as the appropriate tool to uh, collect the information. Following the identification of tagging as a new research priority in the region, Fisheries and Oceans Canada science staff undertook um, almost two years of, of consultation with the New Valuate Game Council and our co-management partner, the Fisheries Joint Management Committee. And so this was to determine, do we need a new tagging program and to initiate the project and consider overarching governance issues like uh, data management. And once all of the partners were comfortable with uh, proceeding with the program and had worked out some of those overarching details, um, we were asked to visit all communities in the New Valley Settlement Region to propose the new program and to, to seek input from the community. And in several communities, people identified um, interest in, in having the tagging data balanced with concerns about the method and uh, recognizing the need to respect wildlife. And somebody actually said, there must be a better way. Uh, we've been using these methods for 30 years, the, the live capture method. Um, and people identified that, you know, they could harvest belugas with a harpoon and tow them and why couldn't we uh, do something like that with the tag. And so that was uh, tabled as a new proposal um, and a challenge from community members. Um, and following those meetings, uh, we, had, we had lots of input and realized that um, we needed a, a mechanism to continue to collaborate and to, to seek a new ballot values and input to be included into the design and delivery of the tagging program going forward. And so we developed the Tagging Advisory Group, or TAG, which was basically a project level steering committee that included Inuvaluate members from the Fisheries Joint Management Committee, uh, the DFO Science Project Team, uh, critical support staff from the Joint Secretariat, and delegates from the Inuvaluate Game Council. So this was one of our main tools for working together. And we also hosted a series of workshops. Um, one of the workshops we held was to co-design the animal use protocol with a new valid beluga harvester. 
So the, the MLU's protocol outlines all the steps and procedures used in handling live animals and considers all the different risks, ways to mitigate these risks and alternative measures. And a, a key recommendation arising from this workshop was to develop and test a new harpoon tagging method during the 2018 field program. And so we invested in, in developing this new method um, and brought commercially available Wilton anchors, uh, originally designed for use on fish, into the field to test on beluga whales. Um, but when experienced beluga harvesters from our field crew saw these anchors, they, they knew that they could make some modifications that would um, make them uh, more suited to use on beluga whales. So this is Dennis Airy and Dwayne Benoit from Aklavik working to modify the commercially available darts. And using their, their modifications and their innovation, we were able to um, harpoon tag four free swimming beluga whales during our initial field pilot. And this demonstrated proof of concept. So it was really an exciting step. Um, but the, t the duration of the tags on the animal were between two days and two weeks, so pretty short, and we knew that we needed to further develop the method to acquire longer duration uh, data sets. After returning to Inu Valley communities to report back on the results of this initial uh, proof of concept and partnering with the tag manufacturer, we co-hosted a second co-design workshop. The goal of this second workshop was to develop a harpoon tagging system to set initial deployment protocols and to develop a study design that we could bring to the GAN Council for approval. The workshop was an effective approach for us because we were able to bring in different experts, including beluga harvesters, the tag manufacturer, and telemetry or tagging experts. And we used different approaches. Many were hands-on. People shared videos of beluga swimming behavior and shared knowledge on uh, beluga movement through hunting stories. And there was also a show and tell component where the tag manufacturer brought commercially available anchors and people brought uh, harpoon heads and harpoons and were able to test those anchors on solid muck tufts during the workshop. The photo on the top right shows uh, Adam Kudlak from Ulahakto, who after the first day of the workshop went and carved um, a prototype of a new harpoon anchor or, or tagging dart based on um, what he had heard and what was shared at the workshop. And he, he did this out of caribou antler and brought it back the next day uh, for people to use um, as a discussion point as we continue to develop this new tool. And what Adam had developed was based on the Wildlife Computer's Wilton dart input from the uh, harpoon co-design workshop and following some additional discussion with our tagging advisory group, this later became a prototype of the Inuvik dart. The Inuvik dart has some features based on traditional Inuvik style toggle anchor for retrieving harvested belugas. And um, because harvesters uh, knew of the arrangement and the texture of beluga skin, so beluga skin is arranged into vertical rods, um, this led to the design that uses an applicator tip to initially puncture the skin and deliver the anchor through the skin and blubber, but leaves no sharp edges inside the animal. So following some initial testing on thawed muktuk in the lab and on landed whales in the field, we conducted our first full field pilot. So um, this video is from Kumala Bay near Tukteyuktuk in July 2019. And what you see here is a, a tagging boat following a pretty large group of beluga whales. And the hunters are able to split the herd and isolate a single whale to pursue for tagging. And so using knowledge and skills from beluga harvesting practices, they're able to follow the whale in turbid water um, and anticipate when it's going to surface to actually do the tagging. During our pilot, after the whale was tagged, we continued to follow it 
um, to collect a biopsy sample. And so this allowed us to confirm tag placement, look at how the tag was performing on the animal and collect that tissue sample um, that we used to determine sex and genetics. So overall, the, the harpoon tagging method was really efficient. Um, we were able to deploy 20 tags on 20 free swimming beluga whales. And uh, we were able to do this in two days. So it was much more efficient than the live capture method. And we saw this as a really exciting, important step um, towards developing this system uh, for broader use. So how did it work out? Well, this is a map showing the movement data acquired from four of the tags. So we used a variety of tag types and only four of them uh, provided location data. Uh, but overall, for all of the tags, retention time exceeded our expectations and lasted between two and six weeks. Um, so six weeks is pretty good. And for these tags that show uh, movement, um, they tended to last longer, so between four and six weeks. And we were able to acquire uh, movement and dive data that was comparable to what we get for the, um, the back-mounted transmitters that are used in the live capture program. So this is a video showing the movement of the whales, um, again, for the tags that provide location data. This splash tag is actually, the guts of it are identical to what we use in the live capture program. So we're really happy with the data that we received back. Um, still six weeks is not six months of data. So, you know, the application depends on what your, your uh, study question is. Uh, and this is something that we'll continue to work on further to assess factors affecting tag retention time. So overall, we see a lot of potential for this method. We've made some good progress towards uh, a method of tagging that's less invasive. Um, it's efficient. It's flexible. Uh, we collect really high resolution data and it can be hunter deployed, but more work is needed and um, will require the collaboration from many different groups and input of many different knowledge types to be successful. In fact, I'm happy to say that just last week we uh, completed a, a three-day focus group with beluga harvesters from Aklavik to help interpret um, some of the videos that we had taken of the harpoon tagging pilot. And so this is to help us look at the relative body size of the whales that were tagged to help interpret their movement behavior um, as well as to identify ways to modify the protocols uh, to further minimize harm to animals and potentially to apply this for work in other areas, as well as to identify different behaviors exhibited by whales uh, to support um, a behavioral analysis of response to the tagging procedure, all with the view of further minimizing harm. And so coming full circle, we return to the communities in winter 2020 just prior to the pandemic to report back on the, the results of the, the full field pilot. And when we visited the communities, community members identified opportunities to fill knowledge gaps from their area. So recall that to date, all Eastern Beaufort Sea Beluga whales have been tagged from one area of the Mackenzie Estuary, where there's guaranteed access to whales and conditions are shallow enough for the capture method to be successful. But we know that belugas show site fidelity, returning to key summering areas on an annual basis. So tagging in one location may mean that we're missing important movement data for a portion of the population. And during meetings, for example, in Aklavik and Politak, community members highlighted the lack of movement data for whales in their area. So here's Darnley Bay near Politak. And so there was some interest expressed in applying the harpoon tagging method to gain a better understanding of Beluga movement and habitat use in places like Shallow Bay and Darling Bay, including connectivity uh, with the broader Beaufort Sea ecosystem. This has important management applications because of the marine protected area in Shallow Bay and Darling Bay and conservation objectives related to protect beluga whales. So in closing, the, the co-design approach was crucial to developing um, new technologies based on a new ballot knowledge and hunting styles. 
um, to address some of those research questions um, and concerns that community members had expressed. And it took um, the use of a variety of approaches, including workshops and advisory groups, um, to make this successful. Um, and it took the input of, of many individuals. So thank you to those who have contributed to the project to date. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shannon. And gosh, are those videos incredible. The videos of the beluga tagging. Um, I do just want to say, I know in the North, we sometimes have some internet issues. So if the streaming of those videos wasn't perfectly clear for you, we are going to be sharing this on our website. So, you know, stay tuned to ARI's social media. And once we've got the videos uploaded, I encourage you to go take a look at that. Those videos from the harpooning and tagging the whales were just incredible to see. Um, so once again, we do have one more question for our audience while we are preparing for the next video. Um, so like I said, this is kind of a new format for us to go virtually for our speaker series. Um, and we love working with the Beluga Research Group because they are always happy to share. They always prioritize, you know, knowledge translation and coming and sharing. So we want to ask our audience, um, if we were to do this again in the future, what do you want to know more about? So please select as many options that you that you want. And if there's something we missed that we didn't provide as an option, type it into the chat. Let us know what you'd like to hear more about, even if it's not about Beluga. Just let us know um, and we can work together to make that happen. If I get to vote, I want to vote for the last option. I want to know about Inuit knowledge from different regions because I was so interested in what Inuit was presenting about the Eastern versus the Western and different practices and even different uh, characteristics in the Beluga populations. Actually, I am going to vote for that. Perfect. So I'm going to leave that poll up for another five seconds. And then I'm going to close it. Or even if, yeah, type in the chat if there's any speakers you want to see. All right, so I'm going to end there. And like I said, if you didn't get a chance or if you have anything else, feel free to type it in the chat. So it looks like Beluga team for the next talk. People, the majority of people want to know more about Beluga and Inuvialuit culture. So let's, we'll chat later and see if we can make that happen. And I'm going to introduce our final presenter is uh, Chiquita Grubin. So up on the screen right now, you've got, oops, let me just take that poll away. So up on the screen, we can see Chiquita's poster from ArcticNet 2020. And this was a conference that happened in December and was virtual. And this was, I don't know how much anybody in the audience knows about the Beaufort Sea Beluga Research Program in 2020. Um, if anybody didn't know, there is currently a global pandemic and the Northwest Territory's borders were closed. However, with, you know, incredible partnerships with the Fisheries Joint Management Committee, with the Hunters and Trappers Committees, and a lot of community members in the Inuvialuit Settlement Region, uh, the Beluga Research Program had an incredible, successful 2020 field season. And Chiquita's got an incredible video that's going to share how that all happened and how it was made possible. So let's hear from Chiquita. My name is uh, Craig Elias. I am a technician for the Aurora Research Institute located in Inuvik. Uh, we had three ARI technicians put together moorings for uh, hydrophones and a sound trap. They were then deployed in June by the um, Inuvik hunters and trappers community near Shingle Point, Shallow Bay, and Hendrickson Island. And then they were retrieved, I think, mid September. And once they were brought back to ARI, then downloaded the data onto hard drives and sent all the equipment back south. My name is Chiquita Grubin. I work for the Joint Secretariat as a junior resource coordinator. My role for the program was to record notes, take a lot of pictures and videos, and um, report back to DFO and Narcan on the results. During the time we went out on the field, it was very refreshing and 
good to be able to travel out on the land to um, do a good thing and help help you guys um, with the project during COVID. And I would say how the project benefited me is that I enjoy um, going out on the field and so it benefited me in ways to like really for me it really like how can I say it like I don't want to use mentally but it did mentally like um it was like really refreshing in a sense of like you know getting to observe the wildlife or like seeing um the beluga whales and just traveling with the crew too and um we like going on a mission and uh getting to have those talks about like, you know, when we bump into the reindeer or the beluga whales, we, we would like start, you know, just talking about them, spotting out wildlife. And, and it was like, really, I'm glad I went with like a clavic too, because like, you know, having to track the mornings down with the GPS and um, getting, so having a sense of feel where they were when we deployed them opposed to retrieving them so well this year we noticed well we we did a lot of the logistics to um all the equipment coming from the south um uh, working with the js um sending out to various communities in the isr for them to start their field programs for the summer um and also receiving uh, samples from the communities and uh, properly uh, storing them and getting them ready for shipping to uh, Winnipeg. I mean, that was that was something new that that we've done. But yeah, being able to help with this program was meaningful to me because I was able to do something I enjoy very much, which is going out on the land, and I got to see a lot of wildlife, and there was a lot of beluga whales out there, and a lot of it. We had an hour, half hours worth of time just seeing them swim around and yeah, it was a privilege to be able to work yet um, feel like it's not really a job because it's something you very, very much enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. Great job, Chiquita. Thank you so much. And I really liked what you said at the end, Rhea. Like, you know, it's not a job. It doesn't feel like a job because it's something you enjoy doing. I think that's, you know, something I've heard from quite a few people who are involved in the Beluga Research Project. Um, so this was concludes our pre-recorded videos. And I know this webinar is a little bit longer than some of the previous ones we've done in the past. So I'm going to just say, if you need to run to the bathroom, get your coffee refilled, get some water, we're going to take a five minute break. So for me in Inuvik, it's 2.30. So we'll meet back here at 2.35. And I'm not sure where all of our time zones are, but grab a coffee, grab some water. And we're going to start uh, answering some of the questions that have come in and our panelists will have a chance to share more. So we will reconnect in five minutes. In whales, there was less of what's called things like essential fatty acids. So 
sometimes people hear about essential fatty acids in their fish or added to their yogurt. Um, so we did see a change in the, the dynamic of the lipids and the structure within them. So I, I hope that answers Dave's question. Yeah, I think so. Um, and this one I think is probably good for everybody on the panel and maybe even some of our audience. If you have any thoughts, type them in the chat. How do you get youth interested in research on belugas during a pandemic? What works best to get in touch with them? So for example, to like to hire youth. I could talk a bit on that. Um, so I uh, previously worked with scientists. I remember the one time um, someone came into the school and did a presentation on their scientific research and that really caught my interest and I'm like what are these people doing coming up here and finding all these interesting things in my hometown <laughs> and so as I got as after I graduated I got involved more with um, researchers I don't know if anyone know Dustin Whalen or Rhiannon Moore but those were the first um, people I have met and um, what we got, we wanted to outreach into the community, but also get youth involved and spark some interest. And so we went into the schools and we presented to them and it helps to like spark their interest, build relationships and to also educate them. And um, that also opens a gateway to the scientists and researchers and um, yeah, to get your project known in the community. So that's it what I would do. Anyone else want to touch on that? I could jump in here. Um, it was so good to hear, hear that to answer Cheetah. Um, we were lucky to work with Cheetah this summer. And so I can say that for us, um, building on existing relationships that have already been established was really important for us. So we met Cheetah through the Joint Secretariat um, and so we work closely with the Fisheries Joint Management Committee and other staff at the Shared Services Unit there who have, you know, in every year helped to deliver um, some of the Beluga programs. And then we heard from Greg Elias at the ARI and the ARI technicians have helped us um, lots as well. And so uh, we've relied on those partnerships. Uh, you, didn't, you didn't hear about um, the Beluga Health Monitoring Program, but we worked with Lionel Kikwak, who's been a um, a youth hired through the Tuck Community Corporation for about five years now, who led the, the sampling of uh, landed belugas at Hendrickson Island that normally DFO scientists would be doing with Lionel and with the beluga monitors there. So kind of building on, you know, what we've already started, uh, but we're always interested in, in working with um, new young people. Um, we have been asked by the Tuck HTC to organize some kind of half in-person, half virtual workshop. So we're thinking about that for some, providing some training opportunities this year. Um, and I'm curious to hear from others as well if they have ideas. I'll jump in. I think this might be a good place. Just as I was watching the presentations, and I know Lisa mentioned this too, it was really great to see so many Aurora College graduates that have been involved in the Beluga Research Program throughout the years. Um, you know, it's, so I, I, if it's something you're interested in, I mean, I know Aurora College has the ENRT program, but even any of the other programs, if you are a student at Aurora College, or if it's something you're interested in, you know, you can re just reach out to an instructor or us over here at ARI, and we'd be more than happy to connect you. And it's just, you know, watching those video, like watching Shannon's videos and a lot of the pictures that were shown throughout all five of these presentations, you can see so many Aurora College graduates. And even looking at who's attending today, I can see so many Aurora College graduates who are now, you know, have participated in the Beluga Research Program or work for FJMC or work for IRC and work for a lot of the co-management organizations in town. Did you want to add anything, Lisa? No, to say this is a new year for us. Well, a new era of working in the north where we're not physically up there, and so we're looking for new ideas to engage people um, in different ways. I 100% agree with the college, so I'm so happy to be doing this with the college. And I think I'll, I'll re reiterate what everyone already said. Um, I did want to point out, I see a question from Kate Matari, or Kate Snow, some of you might know, who was also a youth 
Um, so she was with the Aurora Research Institute, one of the youth programs. And so I would say the, the ARI and a lot of, and, and the Joint Secretariat have youth and are, are so kind in um, allowing us to develop these collaborative programs. Um, it looks like we've got her question, but I, I won't fuel the question. I'll let, I'll let maybe someone else ask the question. No worries. Well, we have actually have quite a few more questions popping in, but let's take Kate's question. Um, all of the samples provided to DFO and others are made possible by the hunters uh, who voluntarily give their time for the catch to be sampled. So with more volatile and unpredictable weather patterns, making the time for harvesting much shorter, has there been any resistance to samples being taken or have you guys seen any resistance from your New Gallo harvesters and partners? I can jump in and take that. So I, I haven't seen a, a market change, but we have always um, been clear to the hunters if you know if the weather's changing, safety first, head home. But I think that's a really good point, Kate, for us to be aware of. And the sampling programs will, will have to evolve. And some years we sample the entire whale, which can take a long time. And so I think we have to be ready for changing changing the way we do things if we want to collect samples given the unpredictability of weather that you point out. So thanks for mentioning it, but I don't know if anyone else here on the call has, has heard of that or, or run into that more recently with climate change. Maybe I'll just jump in to say that I've only worked at Hendrickson Island, so probably lots of people on this call know um, harvesters from Tuck, you know, will often land whales at Hendrickson. And so they need to land their whale and, and butcher it and then go back home. And so that weather can really be an issue there. So I have experienced that where, you know, people need to hurry um, before the weather changes. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's other places where there's um, camps and people are staying when they're doing their harvesting. And so that it might be a little bit different there where the beluga monitors um, and everybody are staying where the whales landed. Um, Kate, I know you have experience with this also. Awesome. Thanks, Shannon. So we've got another question coming in. Uh, how might an offshore liquefied natural gas project in Tuktiaktuk impact beluga health and populations? Should I chip in first on that? From a, um, I guess from like a movement or behavior perspective, um, Obviously, the direct implications are, are the noise that which is produced by um, by implementing such a such a project. Um, I, mean, I don't know exactly about how how big um, a noise footprint a, a natural gas project creates, but I imagine it's um, it's fairly large. So obviously, when you have noise disturbance on belugas, it can affect their vocalizations, it can affect their their behavioural patterns, um, and then indirect impacts. Um, it can damage the, the seafloor. So as I showed you in some of those figures, um, we know that belugas feed at the seafloor in these regions primarily, um, both in, in the inshore as well as principally the, the offshore. Um, but there's also, yeah, some examples of, um, of, of belugas feeding uh, further inshore as well from this population. So um, yeah, so damaging habitats as well. I hope you can hear me all right. I'm sorry, my connection is not ideal today. We can hear you, Luke. Grand. I don't know if anyone else wanted to contribute on the, um, yeah, like the, the health part of that, like, um, I guess. On a political side, well, um, the Innovaluate are like, are like not really, like they are considering definitely like our food and the fish and the blugas, but um, they're not interested in offshore drilling at this moment as there's not only a ban on that right now, but um, also they're starting off with going, digging in the ground, not going offshore. So they're planning to have um, their first gas well 20, about 20 kilometers outside of Tuk, Tuk Tuk Tuk. So that's um, more closer to Husky Lakes, opposed to the ocean right now. So. I wouldn't, we, the talks about that is definitely our traditional food still important and the ocean, we utilize the food in there a lot. And so we're still big on our talks with like, if that interest comes up, we always make sure we protect our environment and wildlife first. 
and ensuring we do it the safest way we can. Um, maybe I'll, I guess I should ask Inu, did you want to add anything to that thinking about Finland on the east? No. Um, oh yeah, I, I was thinking of Alaska and, and their Cook Inlet ones, but you're right, the, um, the narwhal are impacted by shipping in Milne Inlet or in Eclipse Sound, um, and so far, the, the results that are published are inconclusive right now, but um, if you see in the news right now um, that pond and lit hunters are really against the expansion of Baffinland because of the impacts on narwhal. Um, so I, I can't say much to that because I haven't looked at the narwhal um, yet, <laughs> but I think it's it's definitely worth looking at what's happening in Pond and Lit. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but just to make note that there's this other huge project happening in the Eastern Arctic that we might have an opportunity to learn from. Uh, one thing we didn't do today is we didn't really talk about how many whales use that Mackenzie estuary. So it's, it's quite a unique place where we have thousands of whales in that area. And so anytime we're thinking about any change or human impact to the habitat. We, we know there's going to be some repercussions, but understanding the, 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 to what extent and to what level is is um, something we don't know entirely and things that we'd have to look into. But yeah, I think that's a fantastic question. So thanks for bringing that up. Thank you, Lisa and Inu. Another question coming in now. So this is coming from a permafrost scientist and it looks like it sparked when he was listening to Luke's presentation. I was wondering, does thawing permafrost and more carbon being released, more sediments, et cetera, does that affect the belugas in some way? This actually can go to a lot of you guys because it can contaminates everything. I, I could have a stab at first, although I'm, I'm fairly ignorant as to how um, exactly permafrost thawing um, impacts the ecology of like near coastal areas. But I guess I can yeah, have a stab based on um, you know, so when you have riverine inputs in, into the ocean, of course you have um, dumping of, of nutrients into the sea. So um, quite often you get these, these river plumes and you get um, phytoplankton growth near these plumes. So it can increase productivity. Um, so I guess on the one hand, um, you know, permafrost thawing does release some nutrients um, into, the, into the ocean, which can increase productivity. Um, but then obviously if you have too many nutrients um, released it can it can cause overproductivity and like anox anoxic areas but again i'm a bit naive as to how exactly permafrost affects the environment um i'd say in terms of like the, the turbidity from the release of this um you know sediment um that wouldn't have a maybe a direct impact on belugas because they can obviously echolocate to find their prey but yeah i'd be interested if anyone else has any thoughts about the actual um biological implications of, of this permafrost good question though Did anybody else want to jump in there? Oh, go okay, ahead. Well, I'm just going to, I'm going to put Lisa on the spot in a minute, but I'm going to jump in and say that this is a question that comes up often from uh, community members at different meetings that we have. People are very concerned about uh, permafrost um, uh, slumping and getting into the river and then entering the ocean. Um, and so there's a, a couple of projects taking a look at that and I'll, I'll let Lisa explain more about that. Yeah, maybe I'll to say we, we could even touch base on this question in our, if we have another beluga session, we have a student using remote sensing to look at changes in turbidity related to something, a slaw, um, permafrost thaw and slumping, I'm mixing all my words. Um, so we're, I think the impacts, we can look at it in two ways, the physical sense, how that changes the ocean dynamics, the color and those physical properties, but we're also interested in the chemical sense. Is it releasing more mercury, for example? Is it changing the carbon cycle in a way is it how is that affecting ocean acidification for example so those are new questions that i think we're just starting to think about and look not think about but begin to investigate and it's um yeah interesting and and thanks for raising that question thank you guys so actually just being cognizant of the time we had scheduled this to 245 so unfortunately i think this is all the time we have for questions however if you did have more questions 
um, I encourage you, you can actually message ARI on Facebook, you can send us an email and we are more than happy to put you in touch with the Beluga Research Team. Uh, I'm also going to put the team on the spot and say they're great to work with and they are really happy to share results to do events like this. So if you would like to, you know, we're going to take that survey question of what would you like to learn more about and really hope that we can schedule um, another session like this and have a chance to share more information to bring more community partners together and learn more about the Beluga research in the ISR. So I just want to take another opportunity and thank everybody for attending the webinar today. It was incredibly well attended. It was wonderful to see such a diverse audience. We really, really appreciate you taking, you know, two hours out of your day to spend it with us and to learn about Beluga research in the ISR. Um, so just like I mentioned, we are going to be sharing the recording of this webinar so you can find it on ARI social media. We'll promote it and you can also find it on our website. Um, we do have the webinar set up right now so that when you close, there will be two more poll questions popping up. And actually, I think I can do them now. And this is just for us to know. And I know, you know, sometimes in the north, the internet quality might not be the best. So we just want to know how is your viewing experience today? You know, did you have any streaming issues? Just let us know, you know, to make it better for the future. And again, I want to say a really big thank you to our panelists as well. And I'm going to throw one more plug in there. If you are a student in the NWT and you want to get involved with this research, you know, ask your instructor or your teacher to connect you with Aurora Research Institute. And we are more than happy to put you in touch with the Beluga research team because they are phenomenal. So thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful Tuesday.